He used to run track back in, well, in junior high. I didn't do it in high school. So little, you can see, think of little skinny Jamie getting on the track field. And I would particularly do the running events. And so one event that we would always do was the 400 meter relay. So it was a four by 100 relay. There were four of us stationed all throughout the track, kind of at approximately 100 meter intervals. And if you've ever, if you've never seen this, it's, you kind of think, why is this a sport? But there's a lot of, of teamwork that goes into a four by 100 relay. And really, it all focuses on passing the baton. So everybody, the first person starts with the baton, there's the, the gunshot and they take off, and probably at about the 80 meter mark, no, we'll say the 90 meter mark. The next person is stationed and is, is just waiting to go. Now the key in this 100 meter relay is to make sure that you pass the baton when both your uh, runners are going at top speed. And so you need to coordinate with each other so that one can take off and get going and be ready to receive the baton and then uh, continue on in stride. So hopefully not slowing down, not stumbling, and certainly not dropping the baton. Also, we were told you can't hit other kids with the baton while you're running. So that was a strategy lost. So this, this is the 4 born home relay. And the key is uh, to sit there and wait for a code word. So my, it was one of my best friends was the third runner, and I was running anchor. And so he decided that our code word was going to be popsicle. We thought nobody else is going to come up with an absurd code word like popsicle. And so that was, that was our strategy. As he would, he would come around the corner, and when he thought, I was ready to start running, he would just shout at the top of his lungs, Popsicle. The plan was that I would take off, we would pass the baton, and win the race. This transition period is very similar to what we're going to look at today in our story of, in the Gospel of Mark. So we're continuing through the Gospel, we've been following Jesus as he's worked with this group of fishermen, nobodies, tax collectors, these people who didn't have a lot of value in the sight of society. And he's been working with them, training them, and now they're ready to go out and to start trying this, this kingdom building ministry that Jesus has been at for so long. So join with me as we look at Mark 6, starting in verse 17. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if in any place, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. You remember John from the beginning of the gospel? This was Mark 1. He's the one who baptized Jesus. The heavens split open. The spirit descended. This is John who, before Jesus began his ministry, uh, John had to be arrested. John was a radical. So I'm going to explain what I mean by this word, radical. We'll know this uh, because how many of you love, how many of your favorite vegetable is the radish? I didn't think we'd get any. Okay, we got one. <laughs> You'll know this because they actually both come from the same Latin word. It's called, it's radix, and it means root. So radish is a root. I don't know why we didn't call carrot radish, but radish got it for some reason. So if radix means root, radical is somebody who is trying to change something at the base level, at the root. So this is trying to change society, trying to change politics, trying to change ourselves at a basic foundational level. It's kind of like uh, gardening. Now, 
I learned how to weed from my dad, which means when there's dandelions and they're growing in the yard, you take the lawnmower and you run them over, and they're gone for another week. My neighbor Helga, when I lived in a house in Citadel, did not like my strategy for dealing with dandelions. And so one day, when I was out mowing the lawn, she, she yelled at me from across the fence. It was a very low fence. She was a very intimidating woman. And she said, you can't do that. You need to get at the dandelions from the root. And I was like, yeah, you're right. But I don't have any gardening tools, so I'm sorry I can't do that. I have to stick with the lawnmower. She said, oh, just wait one moment. She went into her house, and she came back out with a butter knife. And she showed me how to do three pokes, just a three-pronged approach, dig out the root, dandelion, pull it out at the roots, and it's gone forever. And I had no more excuses the rest of the time I lived there to ever have a dandelion-infested field. But that's what we're talking about with a radical. It's somebody who is trying to get at the roots and change the system. This was John. John started out in the wilderness. He wore camel skin or camel fur. He ate wild honey. So he had to go and dig that honey out of the, the beehive. Never try that. He ate locusts, insects. He was the original global warming diet person. This was John, he was a radical. But he also is the one who started, he was the forerunner for Jesus' ministry. And so this means that John was the first runner with the baton. He's the one who started when the gunshot went off. And at Jesus' baptism, we see John and Jesus start to pass the baton from one to the other. Now it's kind of key, if you go back to Mark 1, Jesus doesn't start his ministry until after John goes to prison. That means there was really no overlap between Jesus and John's ministry. Then, once the transition is complete, Jesus goes out and he, he's in the wilderness. He's tempted for 40 days. Jesus here proves his dependency, his reliance, his faith, his trust in God. Now, Jesus as he's been working with these disciples for however long, starts to hand off the baton to them. And this is the beginning of the pass, what we see here in, our, in this passage. This isn't going to finish. They're not going to complete the pass until Pentecost, after Jesus has died, after Jesus has ascended, after the Holy Spirit has fallen. And that's when the disciples are ready to truly take up this baton and carry on Jesus' ministry. But this is where we are. We're here in this passing time, this transition period. And just like Jesus proved his dependency on God during his transition, the disciples now are given the opportunity, but really it's imperative that they learn to depend on God. There's no way that a couple of disciples who were picked up as Jesus was walking down the shoreline are, were going to grow the church from a ragtag band of 12 people to a 3 billion person religion. 3 billion people in the world in some way identify it as a Christian. There was no way they were going to do that on their own. There's just no way. So you can see how crucial it was that they would learn to depend on God. So this is what we're going to talk about the next, uh, the next little bit here. Um, there are some shifts, some radical shifts, kind of at the, at the base level of ourselves, how we see the world, even how we perceive our faith, that we need to make in order to experience this dependence that was so essential for the disciples in our lives today. We need this just as much as they did. So I'm going to start. This first transition is from independence to interdependence. Notice how the disciples had to rely on others. When Jesus said they would go out, there was no miraculous feeding. This is, this, I think we need to um, rewire our understandings of God's provision. Because we read these miraculous stories in the Bible and we see God rained manna down for the Israelites in the wilderness. Or God trained ravens to bring bread to Elijah when he was in hiding. And we, we see these and we think this is what God's provision looks like. But the truth is, God has always and is continuing now 
to do his work in the world through us, through his people, through those who have been uh, redeemed by Jesus, who have had a life-changing encounter and realize uh, they need to change and participate in this. So for the disciples, that meant going from town to town, sharing the good news, um, promoting the power of God, the kingdom of God through exorcisms, through healing, and then allowing those people to take care of them. I once heard a, a modern day parable that I think fits well with this. This whole idea of, does God really provide through others or should I be waiting for something miraculous? There was a man and, there, and uh, he was in his home and the flood started to come. It was 2013, say, downtown Calgary. And there's a flood coming. The waters start to rise so the man gets out of his house, climbs onto his roof and he starts praying to God, please save me. Save me. And so, an oil rig worker in that jacked up truck, the one we all hate to sit beside at the light. I hope nobody has one. The oil, he pulls up and he says, hey, jump in. We'll get you out of here. He says, don't worry. God's going to take care of me. I asked. The rig worker knows a lost cause when he sees it, so he drives off. Now a hoser. When I say hoser, I mean a Canadian plaid shirt, beaver skin toque comes paddling down in a canoe. The waters have risen higher. And he says, hey, jump in. We'll get you out of here. The man says, don't worry. I prayed and my God is going to take care of me. I'll be okay. So the hoser canoes away. Lastly, search and rescue comes flying in on a helicopter. They spot him on the roof. They drop a ladder and they say, we're here. We're your last hope, but we found you. Jump on and we'll take you to safety. And he looks at the ladder and he says, my God's going to save me. And the helicopter takes off. Guess what? He wasn't saved. The man dies in the flood and he meets Jesus. He says, Jesus, why didn't you save me? I prayed and I trusted. And Jesus says, I sent you a truck. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. What more did you need? We so often look for the supernatural that we forget God is providing for us through the people around us every day. We forget that this is the way that God has chosen to work. This is the way that God wants to work. And so to move from independence to interdependence, we really need to overcome this pride, this Western individualistic pride that holds us back from relying on other people. This work ethic that we were taught, we grew up with, Provide for yourself. Don't, you don't need others. We actually, we need to fight against that. We need to lose that. So that we can learn to depend. If we don't depend on others, we can't depend on God. And God can't provide for us. And this goes two ways. This goes to receiving generosity and extending generosity. Just a, just a, a simple real life example of this Kathy and I are facing. We're going in a, in a week to drive out to Saskatoon and stay with some really close friends. And they only have a one bedroom apartment. And so they said, okay, you guys sleep in the bed and we'll sleep on the ground in the living room. And to me, that is so uncomfortable. I'm not here, I want to visit you as a friend. I want to enjoy my time with you. I don't want to impose on your life. But if I want to promote generosity, if I want to be a part of this cycle of of giving to others and receiving, then I, I need to learn to receive it. Another example is you'll see these chocolates on the table here, so beautifully packaged and set aside. These were given to us by a worker at the theater who just went on maternity leave, and before she left, we gave her a little baby shower gift, some clothes, some gift cards, just some little things to get her going for her first baby boy. And after receiving our generosity, she reached out and packaged these chocolates for us. So before you leave, take a chocolate. And, but remember that this is, this is the cycle of generosity. And, and if we can't receive generosity, then we actually stifle it in our community. And we stop the work of God. Because God wants to work through you and through others. So this is our shift from independence to interdependence. Now, 
that is really only possible if we start to change our mindset on generosity. So our next, which is why our next move is to shift from generosity to sacrifice. Now I heard this this week and I, I actually really like this idea. The difference between these, and I, and I don't want to, I'm not downplaying generosity or philanthropy when I say this, but the difference between these is that oftentimes generosity comes out of our excess. That means that we get our, our, whatever we think our standard of life should be, we achieve that. So we have the house that we want, you know, we upgrade our car every couple of years. We make sure that nothing's going to interfere on our career trajectory. And then kind of whatever's left over, we give. And this is good. I'm not, I'm not downplaying that. But that isn't quite the picture of generosity that we see in the New Testament. So instead of this giving out of your excess, I want, you, I want you to picture Jesus and his disciples on a busy, bustling street in Jerusalem. Cows, goats, the smells of, of a real rural life. And across the street in the temple, there's a line of very, very wealthy individuals. They look the part, stand up straight, very confident, clean clothes, tailored. And they walk by the temple collection box and drop a handful of coins, each of them, from that big purse that they're carrying beside. Next guy, dropping handfuls of coins out of their excess. Lots of money that's going to go do lots of good work, no doubt. But then behind them in line is this, I think she was bent over. I think she had a cane. She's hobbling little gray hairs. This old widow, she kind of, she lost her husband 10 years ago. Her kids, her kids aren't doing much for her. Maybe they've died and passed on. Maybe they moved away. She's hobbling along and she comes up to the box. And she takes out her tiny little pouch. Reaches in and pulls out two coins. Looks heavenward. Prays. And drops those in the box. And that Jesus turns to his disciples with tears in his eyes, just this big smile on his face, saying, you see that woman? She gave more than everybody else because they gave out of their excess, but she in her poverty gave all that she had. There's something special about sacrificing in generosity. There's something character building when we sacrifice to give to others. And this is a, a radical shift that when we do it, will bring us closer to God. And we will experience God's provision. And we'll be on, on the giving end of God's provision. And no doubt, on the receiving end as well. It's a posture of sacrifice. Now, in this last shift, I think, is essential for us to be able to do that. And this last shift is going from a mindset of attainment to a mindset of contentment. If you've heard this verse before, many of us have probably memorized this. It's, it's right up there with Jeremiah 29, 11. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe some of you have written on a mirror and put it up. Very inspiring words. Rarely quoted with the words that come before it. Paul is saying this in Philippians 4, 13. He's writing this from a prison cell. Paul is not at the top of his game when he says this. And he's explicitly talking about finding contentment regardless of your circumstances. So I'm going to read the, the previous verses that come up, lead up to this, and, and we'll see if it changes your understanding of that verse. Paul says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, 
whether living with little or with lots. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul says this because the secret to contentment isn't through attaining more things. It's not through a bigger house. It's not through a promotion at work or finally uh, getting that friend that you've always wanted. All those things will leave you wanting more. But for Paul, the secret to contentment and, by extension, generosity and, by extension, interdependence on others is by Realizing the joy that we have in the presence of God. Realizing how fulfilling our relationship with Christ can truly be. When we forget about all these other things, these demands on our lives. Social status. Comfort levels. Whatever it is that is holding us back from experiencing this radical generosity, this radical shift that needs to take place. When we realize that that Christ really is enough for us. It's a total game changer. So what I want to do um, with the the rest of our time, I'm going to cue and get the sound table ready. I'm going to spend some time in reflection, but first I want to say, remember my race back at the beginning. So here I am. I'm the anchor. I'm ready to take it home. And my friend yells popsicle. So I just, I take off running. You're not supposed to look backwards because that'll ruin your your step. And and I'm holding my hand out, waiting for the baton, waiting for the baton. It doesn't come. I see the end line. I have to slow down. We had started just a half step too soon. And so when I finally get the baton, I'm not going as fast as I could. And we got second place. So depressing. But the truth is a lot of us have messed up this transition of learning how to depend on God, of learning how to depend on others. And now our Christian life is hampered. And and our churches are hampered because of it.